In the past few years, there have been a number of artificial in, uh, artists using artificial intelligence to create art. And there's a lot of interest and energy and excitement around it. And in the discussions that happen in this space, there's an undercurrent or an explicit question of whether computers can be the artists or whether computers can create art. Can they be creative? And there's a, a follow-up question, which is if computers are doing so much of the work and the creativity, what are humans' role in this whole process? I spent a lot of time painting and drawing, and I've also spent a lot of my career over the past 20 years designing computer algorithms that automatically generate paintings and drawings. And so, for example, here's a, an in art installation I made where you walk up to it, and it makes a painting of you, and as you move around, the computer continually repaints the picture um, in, as you move around. And so I think it's really interesting to think about what is the relationship of the human and the computer and the role of art when the computer is doing so much of the work involved. AI techniques for art became really prominent uh, several years ago with the deep dream methods from Google, um, followed by the neural style transfer method, which became really popular in a lot of cell phone apps. Um, and these things started to show up in art galleries and art exhibitions, and more and more artists started playing with it. And now there's a number of fairly significant contemporary artists who are also playing, experimenting with AI techniques. This work all comes out of the academic research literature. Uh, so this is, these are images from one uh, academic paper, which has some really interesting, really nice results. Uh, but the authors make some fairly stra strong claims in their paper. They say, we propose a new system for generating art. The system generates art by looking at art and learning about style, and their system becomes creative. So they're really saying, essentially, that, that their system is an artist. Uh, these things get into the news media, the headlines, like the AI artist that can create its own painting style, and critics even prefer some of its work to human efforts. And then the, you know, there's the satire. So, like, for example, in uh, HBO's Silicon Valley, there was this clip. I like it. It's really cool. So who painted it? A machine. It's actually the first work of art made by AI to be sold at Sotheby's. So that was a, a year and a half ago. Six months later, Christie's auctioned off an, an AI-generated work for half a million dollars. And as if to emphasize where this picture came from, it was signed with one of the equations used to build the model. <laughs> so then there's the backlash. So here's Jerry Saltz, who's one of the preeminent art critics in the world. And notice how he seems to have completely accepted the idea that the, that the computer is doing all of the work. Initial thoughts, incredibly dull, generic, boring. The programmers are not freeing up the program. I want the robot to tap into its inner robot. Be free. So, so it's possible that this is you know, being played up for effect, but there's really this assumption here that the computer already has its inner life and consciousness and soul and, and, and personality. It's just, just not very good at it, uh, being an artist. Um, and so to understand really what's going to happen, what, what is happening, it's worth looking back in the history of how technology has influenced art. It's really transformed it many, many times in history, and often technology has really disrupted conventional art practices. So, for example, in the 15th century, the development of oil paint gave artists a much richer palette of tones and colors than the previous technologies of fresco. It was much easier to use and let them make much richer uh, visual imagery. And so over the following centuries, artists got better and better at using oil paint, and to the point where they can make very highly realistic images. And it's a little bit hard for us to appreciate this today, when we're in a world that's saturated by photography and video and film all around us. At the time, the way, only way you could see this kind of picture was to go into a gallery and see the work from the hand of a highly talented and skilled artist. And so for the artist, the ability to create realistic imagery was very tied into their ident identity, along with all of their other skills. A threat from this to this came, though, with the, de um, the development of photography. The early you know, uh, tinkerers fiddling with photo uh, photographic techniques, of course, they experimented a lot, and they learned to Instagram their food and to take <laughs> selfies. Um, but the, the threat really became apparent when Daguerre publicly presented his process, and because the, the French government paid him a fee, he made it open to the public for anyone to use. And this seemed like a real threat to artists' identity because here is a machine that you just run, you turn the crank on the machine, and out comes a realistic image. And that seems like that's what the artist does. So from the very first presentation of this work, 
Uh, one classical painter is quoted as having said, from today, painting is dead. It seems like there's a ma machine that does what artists do, and so they're irrelevant. And so, just like there is today now this question around AI, there was a debate for many years as to whether photography was even art. On one side, there was the photographers, the hobbyists and tinkers who experimented with this new tool and started doing stuff with it. And over the decades, they got better and better and started to create more and more expressive and evocative imagery until eventually, by the beginning of the 20th century, photography really became accepted as a valid art form with its own style and modes and aesthetics. Um, but it took a long time. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there was the detractors or the traditionalists, like the famous poet Charles Baudelaire, who wrote, if photography is allowed to stand in for art, it will corrupt it completely, thanks to the stupidity of the multitude. So, you know, us. <laughs> um, but the real uh, transformation came with artists themselves. They had to rethink what it is that they did. So, for example, Vincent van Gogh, in his pivotal year of 1888, wrote to his brother, accurate drawing is not the essential thing to aim at, because the reflection of reality in a mirror would not be a picture at all, no more than a photograph. So, in other words, because there's a machine that can make realistic imagery, maybe what artists do isn't actually that, it's something different. And this really led to the entire modern art movement. It seems like we pro it's very likely we would not have modern art at all if it were not for the invention of photography. Now, people have actually been using computers to make uh, uh, images and art as long as computers have been able to make images. So even from the 60s, there was a bunch of a very a bunch of uh, procedural artists working with computers, such as Vera Molnar. And one of the most significant uh, computer artists of the 20th century was Harold Cohen, who spent his whole career writing software that, when he ran it, could generate an infinite series of different figurative or abstract images. And some of his work is in the collection of some fairly uh, major museums and galleries. Um, and the work that he did was really, he was using the AI software of the day, which in the you know, 60s and 70s, AI meant lists of rules and instructions and case statements. In popular art and computer animation, we saw a lot of the same trends. So the, the folks, the innovators at the Lucasfilm computer division t tell these stories about how they would go down to Disney animation and try to convince them to adopt computers in their uh, animation pipelines. And they said over and over, animators were frightened of the computer. They felt it was going to take away their jobs. And so those folks ended up uh, founding Pixar instead. And in reality, computer animation is an enormously labor-intensive process. It's something that requires the you know, thousands and thousands of hours of highly trained and skilled and creative artists to make every little detail and every motion look good in an animated film. Um, the same things are happening now today with uh, artificial intelligence-driven art. So here are uh, images from two of my favorite artists, Helena Seren and Tom White. And they, they work in different ways, but both of them are controlling a software process. They're writing code, they're training models, they're adjusting data sets, they're adjusting learning rates and fiddling with parameters and doing this whole thing over and over until they get images that they're satisfied with. And so, like all AI software, they're really just using software. The artificial intelligence software itself is not intelligent. It is just dumb software that follows the instructions they give it. And the artists are using these tools as tools like any other artist. If you're really interested in trying this stuff out, I really recommend going to this website, artbreeder.com, which is created by Joel Simon. And it's a way to explore the space of images um, created by a particular model trained at DeepMind. And it's just a really endlessly way, and diverting way to explore an interesting space of imagery and to uh, sort of create images yourself um, on the site. Now, this, still, this, this tells us, you know, the current tools are just software, but maybe someday, computers could get good enough for the software or the AI could get good enough that we would call it an artist. And it's really hard to think about this case because we don't have any examples of other entities that we call artists that are not human. So what does it really take for something that's not human to be considered an artist? And it's, it's really easy to phrase the question in the wrong way. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? So to, to be able to make predictions or, or th think about this, um, I think it's worth think, um, think first recognizing that 
within the, the modern art era, it's really established that whatever an artist does can, can be art. There's not really any particular criteria in terms of technical skill or form or aesthetics. And so really the question is, what can be an artist? What makes it so that something that's not human can be an artist? And I personally find the explanation for the, the role of art, of uh, the evolutionary the theory of art, very persuasive. And basically it says that we create art for sharing and for gifts, for displays of fitness for mating, for displays of social status and tribal affiliation, and also as a means for communication and expression. And uh, especially the, the, the first three of these, but all of these are really about our social relationships. They are things that we do in order to create or affect or strengthen or otherwise uh, modify the relationships that we have with other people. And so I, I argue that art can only be created by agents capable of these social relationships. So you might talk to your, your conversational agent, Siri or Alexa or whatever, and you, you, you exchange information with them, but you don't care about how they feel about you or how their feelings or your relationship with them per se, you really view them as a means to, the end, to an end. And so this tells us that on one hand, if we could ever create human level AI that has the same consciousness and the same moral standing and so on as the rest of us, then yes, these things ought to be able to create art by definition. But this is science fiction. Who knows if we're ever going to do this? This, this could be 100 years, 100 years off or, or more. Um, social and conversational agents, um, such as paratherapeutic seals, chatbots, Siri, Alexa, Cortana. We, you know, as, as I've mentioned, we have these communicative re interactions with them, but we don't really view them as person-like that they, we care about. You know, we don't have emotional relationships with them, or you know, maybe most of us don't anyways. <laughs> and so it's... You know, we, we, it's pretty unlikely, I think, that we would accept them as artists as well for the same reasons. And finally, the kind of software that most artists are using, which is, you know, you write a bunch of code, uh, out pops some images, and I just don't see how you can under accept these things as artists if you know how they work. But the exciting thing is that, as with previous tools, artists are going to use these new AI tools to create new kinds of art. Um, so, you know, and it's hard, you know, I should say, it's, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen and how these kinds of art will function, what they'll look like. So consider Les Paul, the main inventor and innovator of the electric solid body guitar. You know, he played very nice uh, jazz swing and country tunes. And there's just no way he could have predicted how his invention would have transformed popular music and culture over the following decades. Um, and likewise, as with the old uh, technology innovations of oil paint, photography, guitar, electric guitar, computer animation, these new AI software tools are going to provide new uh, expressive forms, new artistic tools that artists are going to use and find new things to do with. And if you are at all inclined, I highly encourage you to check them out and experiment with them uh, and think about and help everyone discover what this new art form is going to look like. Thank you. <laughs>